Well, welcome back, folks. Today we're going to begin the journey of restoring the seat for the Yamaha YL1. Again, this is the original seat I took off the bike, and I have every reason to believe it's the original. The seat itself, of course, is in very poor condition, as you would expect for a 54-year-old motorcycle. However, the pan is very solid. At least appears to be. There's a little surface rust around some of the mounting holes, but generally speaking, I would say the pan is about as good as it gets for a bike this old. One of the reasons I believe this is the original seat is you can see the plastic here in various spots where uh, I think that's a factory plastic that's removed when the bike is put in service, and uh, the clamps, these little uh, metal tabs around the perimeter don't look like they've ever been bent back before, so pretty confident this is the original seat. Now my intention during the this course of these videos, and I'll probably be at least a couple, I'm not sure yet, but I'm going to guess we're going to have at least a couple, is take the seat all apart and uh, refinish the base. If I can get the base in my oven, I'll powder coat it. I haven't uh, tested it yet, but we'll see. If I can't powder coat it, then I'll go ahead and spray paint it with uh, either a rattle can or my uh, one of my other um, pressurized um, sprayers later on when it gets a little bit warmer outside. First thing I need to do is gently bend these tabs up, and you can see here where I'm pointing to these metal tabs. Uh, that's how this particular seat is secured. Again, that's a very common method. You have to be real careful with these when you bend them. Sometimes they're quite rusty and they'll break off on you. That's not catastrophic. You can recover from that, but it's um, much wiser just to take your time, get a little screwdriver underneath there and lift these tabs and pre preserve them if at all possible. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, take a few photos of this, how it's put together right now on this back side. I haven't done that yet. And then I'll begin the process of gently working these tabs back using probably a flat bladed screwdriver. I'll show some of that. I won't show the whole thing because it'll be quite tedious, but I'll give you a flavor of what it looks like uh, as I go. Here's some of the tools I've got ready to go to uh, bend those metal tabs back. I'm not sure exactly if I'm going to need all of these, but I've got them ready in case I do. Again, you can see one of those little metal tabs that's just pinched over to crimp the seat itself. Usually I try to start with a broad screwdriver like this one. You want to just get it underneath that tab. Just gently work it back. I work it no further than I absolutely have to to be able to get this seat out, like you can see there. And I'll just complete this process of working my way around the seat pan, and then we'll pull the cover off. I've got all the clamps loosened up, so now it's just a matter of peeling the seat back, seat cover. And as you can see, I have not done this yet, so you're seeing it for the first time along with me. See the bead here separated from the seat. I think my biggest challenge on this is going to be the foam. I have not found any 
reproduction foam for this seat yet. And I think this foam is going to be in very poor condition. There. So there's a seat cover. Of course, that's of no use anymore. And there's the seat itself. Foam at one time very likely came down here, went up, and followed the outline of the seat all the way around. see here how that was done. This is all gone. I might be able to preserve some of this. I really want to save the foam. Again, if nothing else, to use as a pattern. So I'm just doing a little bit of an inspection here to see what it looks like. Well, there you can see the seat pan. And notice this uh, trim piece right here. One time that went all the way around the edge. Back part here is missing. That'll be pretty easily replaced. Right now I'm just going to set the foam aside and look at the pan for a moment. It's gotten wet obviously at one time, but I don't um, I don't think it's rusted through anywhere. I don't even think it's really rusted beyond the surface rust you see. So what I'm going to do with this pan, I think. So I'm going to scrape it down, probably a putty knife, get all this debris off of it, and eventually I'm going to take it over to my uh, blast tank, or my, rather my media blast cabinet, and um, bead blast it, get it down to bare metal. Probably will soak it in a uh, rust dissolving solution like I've demonstrated before, I've talked about other videos. And um, certainly salvageable. Some of the clamps might have to be straightened out a little bit. Look like a couple of them got uh, kind of deformed here. The first thing I'm going to do is clean this all up and try to get the bare metal. This label right here, this it says H2.610244. I cannot preserve that. I'm not even going to attempt to. It's just paper. In fact, I'm surprised it lasted as long as it did. So, I'm going to go ahead and clean this up in my uh, uh, media tank, blast media tank, and uh, we'll pick up the video after that. Well, it's a day or so later, and I've got the seat pan uh, media blasted, as you can see there. A couple of things I noticed. One is that there's a couple of stress cracks, one there and there, which is where these uh, seat brackets where it mounts to the frame are attached. I've always believed this bike was ridden off-road probably by some teenagers and probably the constant pounding as they go over the whoop de doos and hills and dales has created these stress cracks. So what I'm going to do eventually 
is I'm going to just uh, weld those up just so they don't continue to propagate, even though it's the spike isn't intended to ever be ridden uh, aggressively again. But I'll, I'll fix those with my MIG welder. Some of the uh, clamps, the little metal clamps right here around the perimeter were a little bit distorted and bent out of shape. That's uh, also pretty common. So I went through with a pair of needle nose pliers and generally straightened them out and tried to get them all to be in about the same orientation and condition. Fortunately, none of them are broke. Uh, they quite often break from stressing that being overbent or being rusty and they'll just break off. But I'm very fortunate with uh, this pan that didn't happen. So what I'm going to do next is this pan is going to be immersed uh, in a plastic tub with uh, rust remover. I talked about rust removers in the past. I'll probably have to reorient the part a number of times because I don't think I have enough rust remover to do it all at once. So that might take a couple of days to pull that off. And uh, after that, then I'll media blast it once again. And somewhere along the way, I'll uh, have to repair these stress cracks. So I'm going to go ahead and immerse this in a bath of rust remover for, uh, for a few days here. And uh, we'll pick it up a little bit later on. I thought I'd uh, show you a little bit this Rube Goldberg device I've set up to uh, soak the seat pan in rust remover. I've only got about a gallon of this uh, rust remover left. And we're right in the middle of the coronavirus uh, stay at home order in my state, so I'm not going to run out and make a special trip to pick up more and uh, We probably won't be going out for groceries for the better part of a week now, so I and I didn't really want to wait So what I've done and I've used this technique before uh, Last time I think was when I had to flush the inside of the frame of the Yamaha YL1 in the bottom of the uh, plastic pan here I have a aquarium pump and uh, it's a submersible pump of course that's immersed in the solution, the rust removing solution with just a plastic hose and it's just circ circulating the fluid. And then I have it clamped over here with a piece of copper wire just clamped to a bucket. And the reason for that is that this will allow me to reposition uh, over time like this by bending the wire. Right now I just happen to have it in the middle. But eventually, over the course of the next few days, I'll move this back and forth, and then I'll reposition and put the, top, the end that's at the top right now at the bottom, and I'll do the same thing on both sides. So it might take three or four days, maybe even more. And I am aware I will, I will lose some of the solution to evaporation, but I'm going to have to buy more anyway because I'm, like I said, I'm down to about a gallon or so. And I usually like to keep a couple gallons around. So I'm going to end up buying more eventually anyway. So the loss through evaporation isn't terribly concerning to me at this point. Rather, I want to get on with the project. So I will leave the, and I just started this, by the way, five minutes ago. So I'll leave the pump in this position, uh, oh, probably for six, eight hours, and then I will move it over like this for another six or eight hours and then I'll move it over like this. I'll let it run overnight, which of course will be more than six hours or so. It'll probably be more like 10 or 12 hours. And then I'll just continue the process for the next uh, number of days until I've reached the point that I'm satisfied. I've applied the solution to the pan. And then I'll dry it good. I'll rinse it clean water. I'll dry it good and then we'll go back over eventually to the uh, media cabinet and I'll blast it one last time. I thought folks might be interested in seeing this. That's why I'm uh, sharing it with you right now. And we'll uh, pick this up a little bit It's later. been a little bit over a week now and I ran the pan under that flow of the rust uh, remover that I depicted, that little root Goldberg pump. And, uh, and then I hit it again with a sandblast cabinet. And this is what you see here that just came out of the cabinet a minute ago. What I'm going to do now is I have these two welds, or rather these two uh, stress cracks right here. There's one there. 
There's one there, and there's actually a small one right where my thumb is that I talked about before. So what I'm going to try to do is just push this, these two points down a bit, and then I'm going to hit this with my welder, probably just tack it a few times just to prevent those cracks from propagating any further, and I'll, I'll hit that one as well. Once I've got the welding done and those repairs to these stress fractures, then I will go back to the blast cabinet one last time, do a real thorough cleaning of the blast cabinet. I'll wash it down, and then eventually we're going to get to powder coating. I do think this will fit in my oven just barely. I did a test fit a week or so ago before I started uh, this process, and I think it will fit, but it's going to be tight. It's about 10 minutes later, and I just finished... Uh, putting some welds on these stress cracks, as you can see here. I didn't put a lot of effort into doing a great job. It's going to be covered by the seat foam anyway. I did clean the middle well and just hit some tacks, as you can see, I think right there. I'm not going to grind these down. There's really no need to because the uh, seat foam is going to cover it anyway. And you can see where the heat came through on the back side there a bit. So the welding's done, the repair's done, back to the uh, bead blast cabinet for one last uh, clean up before I wash it good and we'll move on to the... I got everything set up here now to powder coat the seat pan. You can see I got it supported on the rack that comes out of the oven. I've got it supported very firmly so it can't really move around. Uh, that uh, seat pan fits with about half an inch of clearance on the sides. That's about 13 millimeters. That's total clearance, so I divide that by two for how much room I have on each side. Six millimeters, quarter of an inch on each side is what I have to work with. And once I've got the powder on it, I don't want to bump the walls of the oven, so I had to do quite a bit of test fitting. Probably spent 20 minutes making sure that fit just right, and then I secured it to the grill, the rack, as you can see there with uh, copper wire. You'll also see down here in the lower right corner, that's that screen that goes in the hole in the middle of the seat pan between the foam and the seat pan. I think that's probably for ventilation and drainage. I'm guessing that originally was probably uh, zinc plated. I don't think it was powder coated, but I'm not going to bother zinc plating it. Uh, it's not seen anyway, and powder coating will give it a very durable finish. So that's why I've got that uh, suspended right there, uh, ready to powder coat as well. So I'm going to show a little bit of this process. I believe you've seen me do it before in at least one, if not two or more other videos. This is not a powder coating video. It's really just to show you the process I'm going through to restore, restore the seat pan. So we're going to go ahead now and shoot that with powder. i got the oven warming up to 400 degrees. And once that's up to temperature, I get the powder on. That'll be just a few minutes. We'll go ahead and slip it in. timer just went off. It's been um, baking now for about 13-14 minutes. 10 minutes to cure, 3-4 minutes to come up to temperature. 
I just shut the oven off and I'm going to let it normalize or come to normal temperature in the oven. And the reason I'm doing that is I've learned in the past from bitter experience, especially with a part as large and fits as tightly in the oven as this one, that paint, that finish rather, is very soft right now and if I bang it up, bring it out, I'm going to end up doing it all over again. So. I'm going to let it normalize in the oven for probably half an hour, 45 minutes. It won't affect the quality of the finish at all because the temperature is now dropping rapidly. And we'll bring it out again in 45 minutes or so and take a look at it. It's been about 40 minutes or so. The pan is just about normalized. Let me shoot it here with my infrared uh, 94 94 94.4 Fahrenheit, 34.7 Celsius, almost room temperature. Uh, it can be handled now, so I'm going to go ahead and pull it out. We'll take a little closer look at it. Well, there you can see the finished pan. It came out pretty good. Um, a little orange peel in this section right here, but uh, that section right there came out really good. It looks like I've got good coverage all the way around and all the seams which can be a challenge with powder coat all the clamps I think I've got good coverage on and of course this is the foam side and you can see there's some pitting here in the surface from moisture sitting against that pan for years because that foam acts like a wick but my primary concern here was to preserve it and it is still good and solid, of course. I'm quite happy with uh, the way that turned out. In the little screen, that came out fine as well. Again, that fits, I believe, like, like that, with the foam over the top of it. I consider this uh, seat pan now finished. What I have to move on to now is figuring out what I'm going to do about this foam right here which is not in very good shape, uh, as you can see. I preserved it, if nothing else, to uh, maintain some sense of the, the shape and size. It looks like it, uh, it got melted right here in this section right along here. That literally looks like it's been melted by heat, though the cover really doesn't show any signs of that. I don't know if it was a chemical that got spilled on it or got a little too close to a heat source just enough to uh, melt that foam. I don't know, but I'm not sure I can do much with this foam outside of use it as a pattern. But being in the middle of this uh, coronavirus situation, uh, I'm not really able to go out and look around for foam. Though I did do some shopping for foam before this all really started, this virus thing. I'm going to have to do, uh, I think, more online shopping and then see what I have in inventory. I might have a little foam around that I can work with. But that will be our next step is sorting through the foam. So it's a week or so later and you can see I've managed to source some high density foam. This is one inch thick, uh, 25 millimeters. You have to buy this, at least everything that I could see, because I can't go out locally due to the restrictions on uh, businesses and travel uh, in my locale during the height of this pandemic. I had to order this online and you're, you're relatively restricted uh, to sizes. So <clears throat> what I got is a 20, 24 inch wide, one inch thick by eight foot long piece of foam. The reason I went with one inch, you can get this in different thicknesses, you can get one inch, two inch, four inch, six inch, I think, and maybe even up to eight, is I thought it would provide me more flexibility. The original foam for this project is a little bit under three and a half inches or eight plus centimeters. Of course, it's been compressed over the years, so it's probably around three and a half inches. And I went with one inch foam and I'll layer it and build it up to give me a little flexibility rather than buying a real thick block of foam and not having quite as much flexibility. I have never actually done this before. Uh, in all my years of working on motorcycles, when I've had to uh, work on the seat foam, I've either 
number one bought repot foam, reproduction foam. In fact, all my other restorations have uh, reproduction foam, I think with the exception of one. I think the G5 Kawasaki 100, I used the original foam and repaired it. The other three or four, three bikes have uh, repot foam. Or I've repaired the foam like I've done, uh, I did on the G5 uh, because it was quite salvageable. The foam for this project is in very poor condition, as you saw. It's very dry, very brittle. You had heat damage. So since I can't find reproduction foam for the YL1, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just have to make my own from scratch. So this is a new adventure for me. This edging right here, this is new edging I bought, also online. Got this from McMaster Car. This is very similar in dimensions to the original. I think as you can probably see right there. And uh, this is quite inexpensive. So it's a soft pliable plastic. So this will uh, be used to trim the edges all the way around because the original trim of course is no good. So my intention is to cut this to size uh, using a shears or scissors, using spray adhesive to build up the depth, and then shape it back to match the original profile. Now I'm not going to show all of those steps uh, for a couple of reasons. One is very messy, very dirty, and I want to be able to concentrate on what I'm doing, and I'm going to have... Uh, foam pieces flying in all directions. And number two, there's a number of very good videos on YouTube that already show this process. So I thought it would be redundant for me to show you all the steps of the process. I will bring you back from time to time at probably the significant uh, phases, during the significant phases, so you can see what I'm up to. But I'm not intending to show the entire process in this video. It'd be quite a long video on top of it. I don't think it's, it's necessary since there's other good content out there that one can watch if they're interested. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on sizing this foam and gluing it onto the pan. Somewhere along the line, I will bring you back. In about 40, 45 minutes, and I have the four layers here all glued together, as you can see. I used just an off-the-shelf uh, spray adhesive. I put a coat on each of the two mating surfaces before I brought them together, let it flash off for a couple minutes, and then just stuck them together. To give you a sense of comparison to the original seat foam, here's the original foam, and that's about, uh, I got my hand on the bottom leveling it so you can see Comparatively speaking, it's a little bit oversized, but again, that's okay because I can shape it down at this point, which is exactly what I'm going to do next. I'll let this, uh, I'll let this foam sit now in this condition for 24 hours, maybe 40 hours, to make sure the adhesive has plenty of time to set, set up, and then I will uh, begin shaping it. It's several days later now, and you can see I've got the foam in a rough general shape that matches the original. Here's the original right here. I might have to take a little bit off the back here and a little bit off the nose to make it um, fit. And I think I'm going to have to trim a little bit more on this side. It's a very messy process, very messy process trimming this foam. So I ended up taking it outside. Otherwise, my shop would have been just full of fuzz like you can see here. So I've been doing it outside when the weather's permitted. We've been we've had very on again off again weather. We'll have a nice comfortable day and then a windy cold day and back and forth. So I haven't been working on it consistently. You can see I did have a little trouble here at the nose piece as I thinned out the foam to try to match the shape of the original here. Since I built this up of layers, it tended to tear away on me, and I started patching some of that in here with bits and pieces of foam. That will be inconsequential when I'm done. It'll be fine. And though I had originally started with three or four sheets, rather, of foam, if you recall, uh, I brought it down to, uh, since I was, as I was shaping it, I found I was getting, that top piece was getting very thin, so I just pulled it off. 
and I think this three inch, uh, one, two, three inch uh, level will be uh, perfectly fine when, when I'm done with it. The tool I ultimately used, and I tried several, uh, I tried using a four and a half inch a grinder with a 80 grit wheel which worked. It worked actually a little bit too well. It was very aggressive and I didn't like the control I had with that big heavy motor and big wheel. So what I ended up doing after some trial and error is moving to this 90 degree die grinder with one of these R style locking um, aggressive abrasive rather wheels like you can see here pads. And you can get these in all different grits. I usually use these for when I weld. And I have them in different grits, like I said. This happens to be 24. Then I've got some 60s. I've got some 80s. And I think I go up to 120. And this actually worked really well. Much easier to control. It didn't want to pull that heavy motor. And if you want a little finer piece, what you can do, which I've done when I for welding, I didn't do it for this project, but I had this left over from welding. You can just take an old scissors and cut that down even smaller. I think, I think these are 2 inch, 50 millimeter. Uh, you can trim it down even smaller, like you see I've done there, if you want a little finer piece, smaller in diameter. But this die grinder uh, worked really well. I was quite pleased with the way that turned out, versus the 4.5 inch uh, heavy grinder, which worked, but uh, I didn't feel I had control. Anyway, what I'm going to do now is, uh, since it's kind of cool out, normally I like to do this out in the sun where I can warm the cover in the sun and uh, the shape it over the, the foam. Uh, and it's cool, cool and breezy out today, so I think I'm going to just gently warm the cover in my oven to around 110, 120 degrees, and then do some test fitting. And um, again, I'm expecting to have to do a little bit more trimming here and probably around the nose piece, maybe even at the rear before it's over. And um, so now it's a matter of finessing at this point. I'm not sure at what stage from now on I'll, I'll bring you back. Certainly when I'm finished with it, I might bring you back somewhere between here and being finished. We'll see how, how it goes. But that's an update right now on the... Well, there it is, folks. The finished um, reupholstered seat for the YL1. This was a lot of work, I have to confess. Uh, I spent off and on, of course, over the better part of a week shaping this foam, putting some foam back, reshaping it, and it, it was a lot of work. Um, in particular, this front section right here, in fact, I still have couple little puckers right here and here it's worse on the left side than the right which is where I had the most trouble. I didn't really have much much issue back here towards the rear but what I ran into and let me just give you a, a shot of what it looks like on the back as you can see there. What I ran into is these corners right here. In fact I ended up reinforcing them with tape just to make sure that that vinyl didn't uh, tear through. And I'll reference the original cover here in a moment because I think they had the same problem on the original cover as I did, which is the way this curve of this uh, seat pan dipped here puts a lot of stress right here on these corners. And my struggle was getting the foam. If I built the foam up and I, I knew I was having a little bit of a problem here because I, I did a number of test fits of the cover and if I built the foam up enough to start to take this out, it started to make this even an even tighter bend right here. And I ended up compromising, trying to reach the point, and still a little fuzz here from shaping the foam. I ended up compromising uh, on the foam to get it to where I could get it to flux around. And I did warm this in the oven, by the way, uh, the seat cover to allow it to stretch and reaching a, that compromise point where I could get it around the corner here and, and try to minimize this pucker and right here in these, these edges. I talked about the original cover, which is right here, and you can see that split in, the, in about that same spot, which is right where it's going underneath right here. 
it was wore through and on one side anyway uh, here's the original foam again for reference and I did use the original foam as a guide as I was working through this but um, of the five four five six seats I've recovered in my restoration career completely re redone this was the latest one this was the most work Probably because I had to do the foam myself versus the other uh, models. I either reused the original foam or was able to buy reproduction foam that was already shaped. This cover also seemed to be a little bit wider through here than the original cover. Uh, at least that's my perception. I didn't spend a lot of time measuring it. But anyway, it's, it's done and I'm reasonably happy with the way it turned out. You can see there, and I did include that screen here for drainage. So I'll consider this seat done now. It was not going to go on the bike right away. This will be one of the very last things along with the fuel tank. I don't want to take a chance of damaging it, so it's going to be covered and put up on the shelf for now. And at the very end, when I'm putting the last um, finishing touches on the project, then I will install the seat, but for now it's going to be left off. One other thing I want to mention real quickly, what I ultimately found were the best things to shape the foam were these mini flap discs used in my uh, angle grinder, die grinder, and I used this soft, almost like a 3M pad to do the finishing work, and I used these three uh, grits. I believe this is 60 80 and 120 and they were they were just great for shaping of that foam they weren't too aggressive and I found that much easier to control than using a four and a half inch uh, angle grinder I think I mentioned that once before but in reality this uh, these little puckers here don't show probably as much in person as they might uh, on the camera I think the harsh light tends to accentuate them but it really it really doesn't look bad. I showed it the seat to my wife and she never noticed them uh, until I pointed them out. She completely uh, didn't, didn't notice them at all. That's going to be it for this video today folks. It's been a long haul on this seat. Any issues, questions, thoughts, drop me a note. Otherwise as usual, thanks for watching.